So let's give a big round of applause to Kate the Chemist and welcome her on stage. Yes. How about A&M? Yes. Okay, I'll take all of it. Wonderful. Um, but I am currently a chemistry 
chemistry professor at the University of Texas. So I actually went to the University of Michigan to get my undergrad. So I have a bachelor's in chemistry and German. The only reason I did German is because they gave us money to study abroad. And I was like, I want to go to Europe. That sounds like fun. I've never left the country. So I did that. Um, it was really fun. And then I came back. I graduated from Michigan, packed everything up in my car, drove across the country, moved down here to Austin, and spent five years studying the Suzuki Mirror cross coupling reaction. Now, I do not expect you to know what that is, but essentially I made one molecule that was really good at bringing two other molecules together. And so I got a PhD in inorganic chemistry. Three weeks later, I got married. Three months later, I started working here. Can you see me? I've left this picture up here long enough. Hopefully you can spot me. But there I am in the middle. Um, so I have two different classes of 500 students each. So I have 1,000 students every single semester. Can you imagine that? Right? Think about it. How many people do we have here? Right? Like maybe 100, maybe two, let's say 200 if we're really reaching for it. Think about how big that classroom is, right? It's really, really big. Now, I love it because I love being on stage, but it's not necessarily the best way for me to teach. So if you look at the pictures, you'll see that I've hired 20 different people that are standing up here. And so in the classroom, I teach for a second, and then my TAs, my LAs, my specialists, we all run around the, the auditorium and we interact with students as much as possible. But you might have noticed that I don't really like staying in one spot, and so virtual teaching was difficult. Did you guys enjoy virtual learning? Yeah. Some yes, some no. Okay. <laughs> It was, it was my nightmare, y'all. I am not very good at like standing in front of that webcam and just teaching and staying in one spot. It was so difficult for me. And you might have noticed that I have tons and tons of energy. And so after about two months of teaching at UT, I went to my boss and I was like, I'm bored. I'm so bored. You need to give me another project, please. Like, I'm going crazy. I need some help. And so with a little bit of negotiation and a phrase I should have never said, which is, I will do it for free. Don't ever say that. Don't ever say it. But they took me up on it. Um, and I'm grateful I did it because, it, again, it changed my world. And so I have this program called Fun with Chemistry. They've actually adapted it. There's a satellite program here at Rice, which I'm really proud of. So it's possible you've interacted with them here from Rice. They go around Houston and do the same thing. But I started this program back in 2014. And every single year, I would go out to Austin kids, blow stuff up, try to get people excited about science. And one thing led to another, and I started getting calls to do things in Newton, Iowa, Roswell, New Mexico, New York, LA, and I just kept saying yes because it sounded like fun. I mean, who doesn't want to figure out how to ship chemicals across the country to do a fun explosion? Like, it was just fun, right? It was a fun challenge, and I really enjoyed it. Um, but every single year, I tried to interact with 20,000 students. My best year was 29,000 students, and that was in 2018. I've never beaten that, but I loved it. It was such a good time. But the reason I talk about it is because it is what truly led me into this whole TV world. And so how this all started was because I got an email from an old man who wanted me to go on TV with him. And he was like, hey, I'm going to be on TV promoting this boring science lecture. That's what he said, a boring science lecture. He was like, will you come with me and do something jazzy? That was the word he used. And I was like, OK, that sounds like fun. I had never been on TV before at that point. So I was like, let's do it. Let's just go for it. Let's do it. And so I get there, it was like a table like this, they didn't even put a microphone on me. So he was here and I was just like handing him gloves, handing him goggles, having the time of my life. And afterwards, the lady who owns the whole business, she's a Dallas woman, I can tell you what that, like can you picture a Dallas woman, right? So the big hair, just like gorgeous, like everything put together. She comes charging into the studio. She's like, that was awesome! Did you do anything for Halloween? And before even thinking, y'all, like I didn't even think about what happened, but I took the palm of my hand, put it in the chest of this old man, and just like kicked him out of the way, ran at her, and I was like, yes, I can make a pumpkin bonnet, I can make it explode, I can make it da -da 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 -da. and she literally went, shh, fine, okay, and walked out. And I was like, okay. So I went back, I did my experiments right here. It worked perfectly. Like, look how happy he is. Well, he's a little scared, but he was happy afterwards. Um, and so it worked really well. And then they invited me back for Thanksgiving, and then New Year's, and then before I knew it, I had a monthly segment on We Are Austin. And so I was able to go and work on my science communication skills, do a science experiment, and promote my love of science, my chemistry that I love so much, and share it with the world. Well, it turns out, if you wear designer heels, and you breathe fire, and you're a girl, uh, people pay attention. And so I ended up reaching out to Amy Polar Smart Girls, they're an organization in Austin, and I was like, I think we should partner together. Like, I have this brand, you have this brand, we should work together, let's promote science. 
And I'm like, okay. So they came to the lab and we did 30 different videos. They worked on my science communication skills again. Again, they invited me to LA and New York. We were talking about doing a TV show together, all because of science. I love science, they love science, and we were able to spread it around. Well, then in 2008, I got a call from this guy. He lives in LA, but he's from New York. So he's like, okay, I think you're going to be the next Bill Nye. And I was like, what? You think I'm going to be the next Bill Nye? Okay, let's go. And so I flew out to LA, signed with the manager, got 21 agents. And then before I knew it, I'd been given this platform that I hadn't really tried to do. So with these managers, with these agents, they got me on all of these TV shows. So Kelly Clarkson, I was just on her show last week. Yes, it was pre-filmed, so it airs in two weeks. So shh, I'm not telling you about that. Okay, so I'm going to be there in two weeks. It's awesome. She's amazing. I love her. She's incredible. And her audience is people of my age, so like a millennial. So when I'm on her show, I have to talk to millennials. Rachel Ray has a bit of an older audience, and so when I go on her show, I need to think about people a little bit older than me. Today show, think about if you watch the Today Show. You're usually at home, maybe you're in the dentist's office, right? So people who don't necessarily want a science lesson at 8 a.m. in the morning, right? So I have to think about that. Nick Cannon, his show shoots in Harlem. So when I go there, yeah, he's awesome, by the way. Um, when I go there, I have to think of an entirely different demographic. I've done a bunch of things with Wendy Williams. Um, so you always have to think about your audience and who you're talking to. But the whole reason I did this entire story of my life was to get to this moment right here. And so this is Stephen Colbert. He is a show on late night television. And so I don't expect you to watch that show or know about it. <laughs> but what's cool about it is I believe I'm the first female scientist to ever perform a science experiment on late night television. And so I'm really, really proud of that because I got this opportunity to represent women and make women in STEM look good. But then I did the thing you're not supposed to do. You know what I did? Explode something, no, it's supposed to be that. And I did that and I did it well. I did a good job. Okay, but what you're not supposed to do is go online afterwards and read the YouTube comments. Right? Yeah? Okay, so I'll be honest with you. Most of it was positive. Most of it was positive. There was a little bit of negative, but do we pay attention to the negative? No. Never, right? We just psh, psh, let it roll off your shoulders. Haters gonna hate. We don't have time for that noise. Absolutely not. We focus on the positive. And so the positive was a bunch of cool comments. One of them was like, science. One was like, that's so cool. Another one was like, I wish I had her as my teacher, which like, oh my god, I love that one. But then there was one that came and just like punched me in the stomach, like right in the core. And it said, I finally found a role model for my 10-year-old self. And like that one hit me right in the stomach. Do you ever have a comment that just like spins in your brain, right? It just goes over and over and over again. I could not get it out of my head. Because you're looking at the person who was raised on Bill Nye. Like, they pushed the TV, I gotta look at this side, they pushed the TV into my classroom, and that's how I was able to watch science in my little, little town. And so I love the fact that I was raised on Bill Nye, but I can't really relate to him. He can't tell me what it's like to be pregnant in the lab. He doesn't know what it's like to work in an environment that's all men. It's very difficult for him to say that. And so what I want to do is step into his shadow and kind of pull back the curtain a little bit and show people what it's like to be a woman in STEM. And so I use this platform to essentially travel across the country, recruit people for what I affectionately refer to as my STEM army. So like it or not, you guys are in it now. Welcome. I hope you like it. It's really fun. You're going to enjoy it. But I recruit people to be in my STEM army, particularly women, because I have a soft spot for that. And what we do is try to represent science and make it look good. Because let's think about science. What can we do with a career in science? We can become doctors. We can become, we can go to research labs. We can work with liquid nitrogen in cryotherapy. We can use it in the research labs where I use liquid nitrogen to slow down reactions because they are so explosive that if you run them at room temperature, you can kill yourself. So what I would do is use liquid nitrogen to cool the temperature down. So instead of the molecules running around like this, they're just kind of lollygagging and interacting with each other. And so I was able to use liquid nitrogen to kind of make myself a lot better. We can also use hydrogen gas to go to the moon, right? We can use it on space shuttles. It's a much cleaner way to use any type of energy. So if we burn hydrogen gas, we're not producing carbon dioxide. So now we can use hydrogen, hopefully someday, on our cars. We can use it in boats. We can use it in planes all over the entire planet we can use science to make the world a better place and I hope you guys can see that it's now I'm going to hopefully show you why I care about this 
What I'm trying to do with my STEM army is try to diminish the stigma around women in STEM. Now we do this locally, nationally, and globally. And so I got my first invitation to go to Hong Kong, so I'm officially international, so I'm super excited about that. But, yeah, okay. but the part of this is that we go to local groups. And so when I get an invitation to come to Houston, I go. I immediately go. I drop everything I can, and I come here. And so I hope you guys think about this. When you become rich and famous and successful, and you have all the money in the world, think about where you came from and come back to this community and make it better by using your skills. I want it to be science. I want it to be chemistry. But no matter what it is, use your skills to make the world better, OK? All right, so now we've got to look at some data because I'm a scientist, and I need to prove to you why this is really important. So let's start here. In the 1900s, out of 100 people who were given a STEM degree, only 0.6 of them were women. Okay, that is appalling. You jump up here, we can see in the 1930s, we see a little bit of a jump because of that First World War. Then we see women go back, back home here in the 1960s, and then we see a huge push, a little bit. But now here, we're only about 30% women. 30%, isn't that appalling? Yes, Kate, that's appalling. I'm so upset. I don't like this, right? That's ridiculous. That is a ridiculous number. Let's look at something else. Let's say we go to college. Okay, this one I like. This one I'm okay with. Out of every degree that we give, one out of two are given to women for bachelor's degrees. So that's good. I will take that. All day I'll take that. We see a little dip when we go to master's degrees. That's the next one, okay? A little bit higher when we go to PhD degrees. In your hard sciences, so your chemistry, your physics, your computer science, that number is way lower. It's closer to 36%. When you get to postdocs, it's even lower at 36 And then here's that one that I just hate. Out of everyone who's employed in a science and engineering degree, 29% of them are women. 29%! That is such a low number, right? Yeah. Yes, there we go. Okay, there we go. That's ridiculous. Let's look at this one. Absolutely make this place better, okay? So how do we do this? 
So the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is encourage young kids in STEM. So I have a young niece. She's adorable, like just the cutest thing in the world. I'm obviously biased. But all the time I hear people tell her, you're so cute. You're so pretty. And when they say that, I want to kick them in the face because it's like she also has a brain, right? She can use her brain. She can use her skills. So if you ever hear that, just follow up. Jump right into the conversation. Be like, and she's so smart. You can see what she do with her science experiments. Oh my gosh, she's great with numbers. So there's easy ways we can build up our younger sisters, okay? Our neighbors, our cousins our peers, we can encourage them and support them. That's an easy way. The second one is support your friend. That's an obvious one, right? Support them. Have you ever made a mistake in a math class? Yes. yes. Does that mean you're not a math person? Yes. No. Just because you make a mistake does not mean you're not a science or a math person, okay? That's garbage. So we have to support each other. When we make a mistake, you're like, cool, now you know it's not that path. Now we go this path and you get to the right answer, okay? So support your friends. Can you do these two things for me, please? Yes. yes. Can you do these for me, please? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. All right, science time. Are you ready? Yes. So what I'm going to do right now is switch over so we can kill the projector if you want. Raise the screen if you, if you have a second, that's fine. So what I'm going to do right now is share three things I've learned along my journey. So I'm only 36. I have so much more to learn, but I have learned a couple things in my 10 years of performing science experiments. And so what I'm going to do now is try to share that with you. And so the first thing is I'm going to need a volunteer. Oh, me! Okay, now you're listening. <laughs> All right, here's the deal. Here's the deal, though. Okay. If you're my volunteer, you have to wear safety equipment. So give me, put your hands down. I gotta give you my little spiel here. All right, so three pieces of safety equipment are must. What is this first one? A lab coat. And so I wear my lab coat to protect my body. It's one of the most important things I wear. What color is my lab coat? Blue. Blue. It is blue. Now the reason I wear blue is because it is flame retardant. So if you ever see a white lab coat, it means it's not resistant to flame. But a blue lab coat probably is. You also can see these markers here on the side that indicate whether or not your lab coat is resistant to flame. Now, I'm not allowed to play with fire, but this is still my standard lab coat, so I wear it all the time. You are not going to have to wear one, but I just want to make sure you're fully aware of why we wear them and why they move. Okay, next thing. We have to wear these things for these goggles. Beautiful, beautiful. So now there's two types of goggles here. These are actual goggles. These are glasses. I'm going to wear glasses. Which one do you think you're wearing? Goggles. Goggles, absolutely. So your goggles protect your entire face, right? They're completely smashed on my face. There's no liquid that can get in there. But when I put my glasses on, liquid could absolutely get in here. Is it possible to kill that thing? <laughs> All right, so we're going to wear goggles. When you come up here, you will have to wear those. And then you're also going to need to wear gloves. Why do you wear gloves? What do they protect? Your hands. Your hands. Okay, so now these are my standard gloves. These are my black nitrile gloves. I'm going to wear these when I touch everything. We're also going to wear blue cryo gloves when you play with a cryogenic. I have two. Okay, so I need one, two volunteers. Okay, so a jean jacket. Awesome. Your dream, and don't be afraid to be creative when you do it. One of the things that, oh, 
One of my favorite things I did was I wrote a big email trying to beg every organization in this uh, United States to work with me because I wanted to get women excited about science. I went after it. One group responded to that email, but it was Amy Poehler Smart Girls, and they absolutely set me up on my career. So you have to go after it and be creative when you do it. All right, so here's my first thing. What we're going to do is use this container. Hold these, please. Thank you. Okay. So I have this guy. This is my insulated container. Very thick, very insulated. I also have this lid. You see how there's a square at the bottom? So I'm going to put this down here, put this on top of the square. Otherwise, if I didn't do this, my container would actually freeze to this table. Okay? So I'm going to pull this out. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. So here, stay there. Watch it. All right. And so now, when you use liquid nitrogen, make sure you have safety gloves on. Oh, up this, I'll do that part, 
and then I want you to dump the water into this container. So in the container, I have about 10 grams of food grade calcium chloride. That's your first hint. And so what we're going to do is shake it up once she's got the water in there. That's good. No worries, it's okay. And then just shake it up. And then once you feel like you're good with it, just water, just water, it's okay. We're going to go ahead and put it in here. Give it like five more seconds and dump it in. Now in my little squirt bottles, what I have is 2% sodium alginate. Okay, alginate. And then I've dyed them with red, green, and blue. Perfect, great job. So now you have two hands, so pick two colors. What would you like? Perfect. All right, and I've got red. So what we're going to do on the count of three, we're going to dump it right in here. One, two, three, squeeze. There we go. We're going to squeeze, 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 and then we're going to stop. This is the hardest part. We have to count to ten. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi, six Mississippi, seven Mississippi, eight Mississippi, nine Mississippi, ten Mississippi. And then pull it out, show them what you made. Exhale it, you exhale it. Oh, I'm outside. I'm outside. Good, we got there. 
on red. You can pick two colors. Go. <laughs> Bigger, be better, 
We want your next generation to have an easier pathway and we want them to be better, okay? Good, can we do that? Yeah. All right, so unfortunately, it's time for the grand finale, okay? I know, I'm so sorry, I'm sorry. Luckily, oh, I can't, oh, I get so much trouble if I ask you up here. Oh, they'd be mad, okay, can't do that. So, but here's the deal, y'all. I have one more piece of advice and my last piece of advice is that I want you to breathe fire. Now, usually, usually this is when I would teach you how to breathe fire, but it's principle, so no. So instead, I'm going to do something different. The opposite of fire. What's the opposite of fire? Water. Water and very cold. Very cold. Why? So I am going to make a big cold explosion because I think that's the opposite of fire.